Is it really possible that the Great Sphinx is mentioned directly in ancient texts all throughout history? On the face of it, the fact is we know very little about this ancient monument's extraordinary past, but thanks to dedicated research from the author Graham Hancock, we can see similarities throughout ancient documents that are more or less referring to this ancient legend. Imagine the Sphinx as a thing of movement, a protector and a destroyer. Under the Sphinx's watchful gaze, we theorize about the movement of the stars, about the astronomical alignment that is triggered at 26,000 year intervals. We have also speculated as to what the original features of the Sphinx may have been. The reconstruction of the head in particular, with the god Anubis being the most likely character to have been the originality here. But who built this majestic monument and why? A dramatic reference from Exodus 12:23 reads, God will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, God will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you down. According to Chronicles 21, the destroyer is massive, dominating its surrounding and easily visible from a distance to humans. All throughout the text of the ancient Colbrin, the destroyer is constantly referenced as being something that visits the earth with destructive power so unbelievable that it is beyond humankind's comprehension. So basically, what is referred to here is a giant UFO battleship flying through the sky and armed to the teeth. Some have went as far to suggest that this may be a description of the arrival of the Anunnaki. Within Greek texts, the god Typhon is the destroyer as well as many other cultures across the globe where a dragon-like monster sweeps through the sky. There's little doubt that this is describing a UFO of sorts. Perhaps in the Zoroastrian reliefs, the hint as to what this was can be found. It will come in 100 generations. The Colburn says that at one time mankind divided the year into a summer half and a winter half with a great year circle of 52 years, 104 of which was the circle of the destroyer. This kind of knowledge implies that someone somewhere had been observing the earth long enough to record the destroyer's huge orbit, where Kimma and the destroyer one and the same. In the Colburn's Book of Gleanings, a Sumerian based account of the great flood describes the destroyer newly released from the confines of the sky vaults raging about the heavens accompanied by a second destructive force which sounds much like the double entity Kima. on other occasions the destroyer is referred to as a single force doesn't this sound like some sort of craft buzzing about the sky and what about the remodeling of the head of the sphinx if the sphinx's voice was an early warning system did the mechanism become redundant as centuries passed did the Egyptians forget how to operate it, or did the head itself suffer damage from earthquakes and interference by man, or did the mechanism simply wear out? Was that why the head was remodeled? Is there a clue to this mechanism behind the ear of the Sphinx? Robert Temple has much to say to the Sphinx mystery about the recarving of the Sphinx head. He bases his analysis on an 1897 article by the German Egyptologist Ludwig Borchert. During the century and a half of chaos, floods, drought, and famine of the terrible time known as the First Intermediate Period, when the government collapsed and mobs ran amok, smashing everything in their rage, the head of Anubis must have been drastically mutilated. When order returned under the Middle Kingdom and the Twelfth Dynasty was established, the third king of that dynasty took an interest in the mutilated statue of Anubis. That king was Pharaoh Amenhotep II. Because the head of Anubis was ruined beyond repair, he had a new and smaller head carved out of the neck. That head was a human head, and his face was his own. If you look at the upper turned face of the Giza Sphinx, set beside the upper turned face of the Amenhotep II Tanis Sphinx, in the Louvre Museum in Paris, the resemblance in ears, face shape, eyes, and mouth is remarkable. The Great Guardian Snippet finishes with the words, As is written, the Great Vault. 
Could this be another name for the Hall of Records, a legendary chamber said by ancient writers to house early Egyptian records inscribed with the history of the lost civilization of Atlantis? The Hall of Records has become every Egyptologist's holy grail. It is intriguing that the Dream Stealer shows the Sphinx set on a square pedestal with a central doorway and recessed decoration. Robert N. Scotch and Dr. Thomas L. DeBecky have used ground penetrating radar to show that there are indeed cavities beneath the Sphinx, but to date, the hall has not been found. The Colbrin, now just a patchwork of books and bits of books, was once a vast collection of scrolls and ring bound volumes of the old religion known as the Sacred Records. Originally, it comprised 132 scrolls and five ring-bound volumes, which made up the Great Book of the Egyptians and the Lesser Book of the Egyptians. A chapter in the Book of the Sons of Fire records how four complete sets of the Greater Books and the Lesser Books were put in great arcs inside four masonry casing, which were removed to the four quarters of the earth and watched over by guardians. Later, when civil wars split apart the Egyptian religious institutions and the old religion was threatened with annihilation, a complete set of sacred records was removed from the eastern quarter and smuggled out of Egypt. Could Giza be one of those quarters? If so, then a complete copy of the Colbrin's Egyptian books in their original language might even now be lying deep underground among other records guarded over by the mysterious great guardian Rachma, which we know as the Great Sphinx. Even more intriguing, if they were loaded onto great arcs and sent to the four quarters of the earth, then perhaps the Mayans, the Chinese, and the ancient Indians, as well as the Egyptians, rose up as a civilization with this knowledge to hand. We ask why our cultures, separated by thousands of miles, have similar style building techniques that are always attributed to the gods. Perhaps this is literal and not mythological. Anyway guys, this concludes our Sphinx mini-series. This was part 4, and you can check out the other 3 parts using the links below. This of course is based on research by Graham Hancock, and we will of course link these sources below also for you to go and check out for yourself. Let us know below what your thoughts are, and as always, thank you for watching.